Hey everyone, okay, so picking up right where we left off yesterday, um, we were talking about inference to the best explanation, and uh, remember again, we're not going to be evaluating for full, the logic of a full inference to the best explanation, because that requires figuring out what's the best explanation, and we'll have to um, compare the explanation being offered with other alternative ways of trying to explain what is to be explained. Um, so I've got the little chart up here again on our whiteboard. Um, again, what you'd get in black, or, or what is in black in the diagram, is what you're going to be able to uh, see in the problem that you're being asked to evaluate. All we're going to be doing is taking a look at a proposed explanation and evaluating that explanation based on the seven criteria that we have to do that. So we talked through the first two yesterday, and we're going to do the other five today, and that's the plan. Yes, yeah, sorry everyone who has to go um, because of the bad connection. We've had technical difficulties this morning. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube later, uh, I'm going to be trying to figure this out uh, over the weekend uh, with the internet with my neighbor. Um, right now I'm, I'm actually broadcasting using a mobile hotspot on my phone, and that's why the connection is so, so terrible. Um, so that'll be hopefully fixed for next week, and we won't have to deal with this again. Um, but let's let's get into the content here. Um, so we had a story to tell and depth. That's what we talked about yesterday. And just as a brief recap for this, um, the first criteria, the story to tell bit, the key idea here is that if there are multiple things to be explained um, in the, these observations, the things that we know are true, but we're wondering why are they the case, um, if there's multiple stuff here and not just one thing, then we want the hypothesis, a better hypothesis, a better explanation would be able to at least attempt to explain everything that's in the stuff to be explained. So this, what is the stuff to be explained depends on the context. Um, I've used some examples uh, in class yesterday about explanatory situations or where we'd be tempted to use inference the best explanation because we can't directly observe what's going on. We just have these facts that we know are the case that we have directly observed and we're speculating about why are they the way that they are. Um, so take a, take again my my example of going to the doctor and you know you tell the doctor your symptoms and the doctor's like oh I think you might have this. They diagnose your condition based on trying to explain the symptoms that you have. Or if you're going on like WebMD or something, trying to self-diagnose, you're going to be doing it this way. And there might be multiple symptoms that stand in need of explanation. And if the hypothesis can explain all of them, that's better than if it can only explain some of them. So that's why I drew multiple arrows here uh, to figure that out. If you're in a scenario where there's only one thing to be explained, then this standard gets trivially passed because they're offering some explanation. They're throwing something at it, um, and so that would be passed. But in cases where there are multiple things to be explained, then this might be more relevant. Um, depth, uh, the phrase I gave you yesterday for depth was, you, you're asking, if, if you're wondering whether the explanation is deep, you're wondering, does the story being told, is the explanation standing in need of further explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. And it basically, another way I can summarize that is to say, uh, the question is, is the explanation offered sufficient? Is the hypothesis sufficient to be able to explain the stuff to be explained? And we use the example of, I don't see anyone in our classroom, even though we normally have class at this time, because a wicked witch made them all invisible. Now, that hypothesis, that a wicked witch made everyone invisible, um, that raises a whole lot of questions, but not questions that matter for depth. You know, in terms of the hypothesis itself, that everyone was made invisible, that would explain why I can't see them. And that's why the technique I was telling you for testing depth is to just assume that the hypothesis is true and ask uh, if you'd expect the stuff to be explained, the observations, the explanandum, um, ask if you would automatically expect those things, or whether there's sort of a gap in the story here that needs to be filled in with some further explanation. Like in the example I gave of uh, walking around with a limp, and my students were like, why do you got a limp, Tim? And I was like, I had too much fun last night. You know, that's part of a story, but it doesn't tell the full story. You wouldn't think, oh, because Tim had too much fun last night, he must have a limp. 
you know, that's that's not going to follow. Um, so going back to the Wicked Witch one, though, if there's other questions like, why did the Wicked Witch make them invisible? Or how could they have the power to do so? Um, you know, those questions um, don't are not relevant for depth. In other words, and this is the key tip here, or piece of advice for not um, making mistakes here with evaluating depth, um, keep in mind that in order for an, uh, an explanation to be deep, you don't need to explain the explanation as if it was a thing that you know gets an, an another explanatory move here. That's why I drew the arrow about the connecting arrow between the hypothesis and the stuff to be explained. If you're offering an explanation for why the hypothesis is true, that's just a different explanation. Okay, just like how if you had a sub argument to defend a main argument. The sub-argument's a different argument than the main argument. If you're trying to figure out, is this good logic, the sub-argument is not required uh, to figure that out. It's just a different argument. Okay, so that's depth. Um, for those of you who are still surviving in the chat today uh, with the bad connection, um, anyone have questions about that? How's this going? Any, any leftover questions from yesterday about story to tell in depth? Some people are typing. Is depth based on inductive strength or weakness of an explanation? Um, that's what we're trying to determine with these standards. Um, story to tell, depth, all the ones that are going to happen later, all of them are evaluating the inductive strength of the explanation itself. But an explanation is not an inference. Um, it's just an attempt to say, here's what's going on. Um, Jaden says, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're having the bad connections. Yeah, so I was saying earlier, uh, we're, we're having technical difficulties today. If it's not working for you, I, I think the best choice right now is just watch it on YouTube later. Um, and I, I apologize for, for this not being accessible live to you today. Hopefully this is not going to happen again. Um, but there, I'm having issues with my neighbor's Wi-Fi, so that's what's happening. So that, I think that's a good choice, Jaden, and I'm sorry you have to make it. Okay, so let's uh, let's go into our next standard here. Our next standard is going to be something called power. Power, and the power of a hypothesis comes from its ability, or lack thereof, of not only being able to explain the stuff that's currently on the table to be explained, but other stuff. I mean, we want explanations for everything in reality. Um, like I talked yesterday, explanations are things we ask about everything that we face, every kind of circumstance or scenario or event um, or dynamic that phenomenon that occurs in reality we want explanations for um, having a complete picture of reality is always something that we're invested in um, and be, for a hypothesis to be able to work in the situation being offered like it's a deep explanation here that's good but we also might be thinking out of the corner of our eye about whether it could help with some other things too and that would make it a better explanation rather than in contrast um, having a hypothesis which is ad hoc. It's only working for this scenario and nothing else. Ideally, this hypothesis will be useful for other scenarios too. And I'll give you some examples of this um, and why this might matter to us. Um, but power is basically asking about this. And as a reminder again, when I'm making this chart that we're looking at, everything that is in red are things that you aren't going to be given uh, in the problem. So they're things you have to be anticipating with your own imagination. So what are these other things that the hypothesis could be used to explain? That is uh, something you got to come up with. You're going to have to try to anticipate it using your 
background assumptions about reality, your own intellectual imagination, to try to see if that's possible. In most cases, most hypotheses that are offered for any explanation, you know, any stuff to be explained that we've got on the table, is probably going to be able to work for something else. Um, the question might just be what it is. So if you're doing your homework problems or the exam problem that's going to come up on exam two for IBE, um, if you can just demonstrate to me that you know that power is a matter of whether the hypothesis can explain some other stuff and you're able to come up with some stuff, then I'll know that you understand this standard. So just kind of think about what other things the hypothesis could be used to explain. But let me give you some examples of how this would work and also some, some circumstances in which maybe power is not the biggest deal. That it's not something that is um, super important relative to the other standards. So we're going to have, you know, at the end of the day here, we're going to have seven different criteria for evaluating what a good explanation looks like. And um, they're not always, uh, not all the standards are equally relevant in all circumstances. Uh, some of them, you, sometimes you can't have your cake and eat it too. You, you'll have an explanation that's not capable of satisfying every single standard on the list, but it might still be better than any of the other competing explanations. And especially power could be like on to a level degree, like how many other things can this e hypothesis be useful in doing explanatory work? Um, so I'm going to give you a scenario where power would be very important and a scenario in which it wouldn't be that important um, to kind of show the contrast of what can happen here of, of how important each of these standards are. Um, but, but just think again to the context of inference the best explanation. So we're we're wanting to evaluate the explanation that's on the table um, because we're thinking about using this argument strategy that says because this explanation is so useful that's the reason for believing in the hypothesis so we're citing a hypothesis ability to explain things as the reason for thinking it's true so if the hypothesis can explain a whole lot of things it's more useful and that's more feathers in its cap for why we should believe that it's true so let me give you an example where this is very, very relevant. Um, I mentioned uh, before that the, the field of cognitive science is, is one that is mostly run on inference of the best explanation. We just, we don't have the kind of empirical evidence or observations that we would like to have to be able to know directly how the mind works. So we have to kind of reverse engineer the mind and being like, what are the, the functional components of cognition? what enables a mind to happen or thought to happen. And um, the usual way that this works is the stuff to be explained are sort of like our cognitive abilities. Things like we're able to use language or we have uh, faculties of, of perception like visual perception or auditory perception. Um, that we can do mathematics. Um, that we can invent new concepts. That we can um, use logic and make inferences like these are all things that we have demonstrated abilities for like it's obvious I'm able to use language right now that <laughs> we don't have any questions about that we've got direct observations about this occurring um, and the only question is why so someone might come up with a theory of how the mind works that would explain how I'm capable of using language like what is needed in order to be uh, to have this cognitive ability so maybe the topic on the table is explaining our linguistic abilities. And I give a theory for that. And it's deep. You know, it's got a story to tell about all the stuff about language that we, that we need to explain or that we would need to have an explanation for. And it doesn't stand in need of further explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. So it's deep. But we might think, you know, we've got all these different cognitive abilities and they're all being performed by the same brain, same mind. So if I could have a theory of the cognition of language that could also be used to explain other cognitive abilities, like say math, if, if that would be awesome. I mean, that would make sense in the sense that we assume the mind is somehow unified, right? I'm able to, I use language to talk about doing mathematical reasoning. And even mathematical reasoning uses the tools of language in order to be accomplished in us. So it would be natural to expect that there should be a common story 
about how both of those cognitive abilities are possible. Um, what's going on with the mind that could explain not just the language stuff, but also the mathematics and logic stuff. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so a, an explanation, if you had two competing explanations for our linguistic abilities, and one would work to explain math and the other one wouldn't, then the one that can explain math too is better. Okay, it's a stronger explanation. Um, anyone who's still in the chat uh, and able to hear me, uh, how's this going? Can I? <laughs> is there anybody who's able to receive this live and is able to follow along with what I'm talking about and seeing what's on the on the whiteboard? I still have seven people in the chat. I always love to be able to check in and see how things are going with the lecture, uh, if, if no one's able to get it. Uh, yeah, it's slightly better connection with fewer people. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, so um, Danny, you're the only one who responded. Uh, how's it, I get, you're going to be my canary in the coal mine today, I guess. Um, you're a representative for the whole class, no pressure. But uh, is the lecture making sense so far? Have you had any questions about what's going on with power or my illustrations? Think I get it? Okay, I'm going to give you one more example for sure. Yeah. Andrew's got something here. Not clear on it about needed or not needed. Oh, okay, so when would power be a, like a really relevant standard for evaluating explanations versus not? Is that what you mean, Andrew? Okay, all right. So maybe this second illustration is going to help. So um, here's another scenario that we talked about before. I'm the detective at the crime scene. And the stuff to be explained are all the clues that I'm able to observe at the crime scene. And I make a hypothesis about maybe who is, who's the person who committed this crime. Um, and that would, you know, if that was the person who did it, then it would make sense that we see all the evidence that we do see, all this circumstantial evidence um, that we're able to pick up on at the crime scene. Okay, now it might be pretty interesting if the explanation I've offered for this crime to how to explain the crime that's right in front of me also was capable of explaining other crimes that are happening in the city, this other stuff. Okay, that would make it more powerful. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, we'd prefer that explanation over one that only works for the crime scene that's right in front of us. Except in this setting, um, for my hypothesis to have power in that sort of way is not really something we need and not something we would expect. In the cognitive science example I just gave, we have background assumptions about the world that make us think, hey, I've got the same brain that's doing all these different functions. And, and we definitely know at this point that the brain doesn't work the way we used to think it was, like a factory that has different machines and different parts of it, and and everything is sort of discre discreetly separated in the mechanics of our neurons. Now we know that the brain seems more plastic than that, and some parts of the brain can pick up the cognitive tasks that are normally done in some other part of the brain. Um, so it's but it's all one brain. So whatever are all these different cognitive functions that we're capable of. There should be some story, a complete explanation that relates them all to each other. At least that's what we would expect given our background assumptions. But when it comes to the background assumptions we have about crime, we know that a lot of crimes are just one-offs. They're not necessarily all vast conspiracies of like this, like I'm trying to explain the murder, the, a murder that happened at this crime scene. I don't need to assume every time that the person who committed this murder is actually some kind of serial killer who's responsible for lots of murders happening all over the city. And th so we're not, we're not as concerned about whether the hypothesis is powerful. If it only worked to explain this one crime scene, that's probably fine. So power doesn't matter as much here as in, say, the cognitive science example. Uh, is that happening? Um, uh, is that helping, uh, Danny and Andrew? You're the ones who responded to me.
that I guess what I'm saying in terms of the line between whether power is a, a, a more important criteria to be using or a less important one is really circumstantially dependent on what we're talking about and the background assumptions we have about it. So there, there's kind of um, no absolute rule about it. That makes sense? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, in terms of homework and exam, I don't really care so much whether you make a judgment that power matters in this situation or doesn't matter. I mean, the main thing I'm interested in is just that you understand what power is as a phenomenon. That when we're talking about the power of an explanation, we're talking about not only its ability to, to explain the stuff that's on the table to be explained, but sort of anticipating whether it could be useful for explaining some other things that are not currently on the table to be explained. That's this other stuff that I drew in the diagram over here. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. I'm actually going to skip the next one. Um, standard uh, number four, oops, I wanted to make that in red. So standard number four is falsifiability, and I'm going to save that one for last because that one's a little trickier. So let's knock out some, some easier ones here first. Um, so we're going to go next for number five, modesty. And the little phrase that I encourage you to remember here is overkill. That's, that's what we want to think about with um, modesty. And <clears throat> modesty is in an interesting relationship here with depth uh, and with power. And I'm going to talk about those connections here. But basically, the idea of modesty is that we would think a, a better explanation, a stronger explanation, is going to be one that doesn't claim more than it needs to in order to get this stuff explained. So if depth, where I said we were worried about sufficiency, like maybe it's not giving enough, like there needs to be more information or, or uh, uh, you know, more of a story to tell in order to have a sufficient explanation of the stuff to be explained. Modesty is worrying about falling off the other side of the boat, of adding too much information, more than is needed, in order to get that explanatory work done. And the logic of it works like this. If we're citing a claim's explanatory usefulness as the reason for believing that it's true, in inference to best explanation, that's the whole logic of this argument, then anything that's in the hypothesis, any information that we'd be believing in that isn't really contributing uh, work, <laughs> useful work, for, for explaining the stuff to be explained, we don't have any reason to believe it. It's kind of like there would be, if there's this overkill issue, there's some part of the hypothesis that's really doing all the heavy lifting of the explanation. And then there's other stuff on top of it that's sort of uh, piggybacking on it, like a free rider. You know, like um, it's just hanging onto the coattails of the part of the hypothesis that's really doing the explanatory work and coming along for the ride of getting, uh, you know, a rational endorsement. Uh, and that's not appropriate. If, it, if it's not contributing anything that's explanatorily useful, then we don't have reason to believe that that is true. Let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, this is another one that's taken from the book. Um, so the thing to be explained is that there's this light in the night sky that's moving very quickly. And the explanation offered, the hypothesis that's being offered to explain why there's this light in the night sky that's moving very quickly is that it's the like 645 United Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles or something like that. So thinking about that hypothesis, um, ask yourself, here's the technique for testing modesty. Ask yourself, is there more information than is required to get the explanatory work done? In other words, is there a more modest or stripped down or pared down version of the hypothesis that still offers a deep explanation? You know, it's still adequate for explaining the stuff to be explained. In that example with the light in the night sky, um, those of you here in the chat, um, what, do, what do you think is really doing the explanatory work here? Did I, did I lose you? Are you still there? <laughs> Mm 
you know, hypothesis was that it's, uh, I don't know what I said, uh, 645 United Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles. What's really doing the heavy lifting? So it's about explaining the source of the light. That's right. But what part of the hypothesis is, is doing the, the heavy lifting there? What information in that hypothesis is really the crucial part? Explaining that there is a light and that the light is moving quickly. Yeah, that's right. It's an airplane. It's not all the rest of it. Or maybe I misinterpreted what you said, Dania, but yeah, it's the fact that it's a plane. If they had just said, it's an airplane, that's the hypothesis to explain why there's a light in the night sky moving quickly, that would have been deep enough, right? If I'm like, there's an airplane flying in the sky right now up in that location, would I expect that there would be a light moving quickly? Yes. Yes, I would. So that's a deep explanation. And I don't need all the rest of it. All those other details about how it's a United Airlines flight, how it's going from Boston to Los Angeles, or what time it is, that's not really crucial for explaining the stuff to be explained. Um, so is that feeling good? Does that make sense? You can imagine a, a more stripped down or guarded, to call back to annotations here, a more guarded version of the hypothesis that still gets all the explanatory work done that we want. So the, the hypothesis that was offered here is going overkill. It's giving extra details, more information than we need. Um, and that's why it's not modest. So we want, this is a, when it comes to depth and modesty, it's a Goldilocks problem. We need enough information for it to be deep, but not too much, not more than we need to have a deep explanation. We want to catch it just right, just like the Goldilocks story. That's the key part. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to talk about the relationship of modesty with power. So this is another case where we might not, in many cases, we can't have our cake and eat it too. The more information in the hypothesis, the more stuff it's maybe capable of being able to explain. The less stuff that's in the hypothesis, the less power it's going to maybe potentially have. And, but it'll be more modest. So the more information you put in there, higher chance of it not being modest. The less information that you put in there, the less chance it's going to be powerful. So when we're thinking back to that, you, that uh, United Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles sort of thing, those extra details are not useful for explaining why there's a light in the night sky and why it's moving quickly, but it could be helpful for explaining other things like the direction that the, uh, the, flight is, that the light is moving in or the time of day that it's appearing, like why is it happening now? Um, you know, knowing it's the 645 flight, you know, that might be helpful information for being able to explain these other things that were not on the table to be explained, but maybe also things that we would want an explanation for. So there's going to oftentimes be a trade-off here between modesty and power. Um, sometimes you're going to have explanations that can be Power, they're modest and still capable of being powerful. That's the pipe dream. And you're going to have uh, hypotheses that are neither powerful nor modest. I mean, that can happen too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, oftentimes these things are intention. And this is another illustration of how, depending on the circumstances, we might need to decide which of the seven criteria is most relevant for evaluating this particular explanatory project. Um, you don't need to get into too much of that in your, you don't need to be tracking that too much for the exam problems. I, I'm not going to be looking for that in your answers. Again, the main thing I'm interested in is just that your answers demonstrate an understanding of what in principle is going on mm -hmm. with these standards. Okay, um, let's, let's go to the last two here. They're kind of related. So we've got, um, and I know I've got the my webcam is kind of covering up part of the image here, so let's do it over here. Um, I'll put number seven here. Um, conservativeness. There. And then number six is going to be simplicity. Okay. And then 
we're gonna draw by the way this IBE chart that I that I've been drawing for us live in the lecture there's also a version of it that's up on canvas okay so I'm drawing a little like zone here on the chart and this zone represents our background assumptions that's what's going on here so with both simplicity and conservativeness we're thinking about um, we're sort of trying to anticipate what happens when if I accepted this inference the best explanation and I took this hypothesis and I started believing it so I'm basically anticipating what happens when I add it to my stock of background assumptions my background assumptions again are all the beliefs I have about reality and how reality works and all that good stuff so um, everything about how people work, how physics works, how societies work, everything, everything that's a part of my picture of reality. What exists in reality and what kind of existence does it have and what properties does it have? All of that is your background assumptions. This is something you're constantly updating. It's not infallible. You know, it's definitely fallible, but it's sort of everything that we believe outside of the context of what we're discussing right now with this particular explanation. And if we did say, yeah, this is a good explanation, we should believe it, this inference the best explanation context, we would be deciding about whether to add the hypothesis to our stock of beliefs. And what these two standards of simplicity and conservativeness are about is evaluating that move, sort of trying to predict what would happen. And I'm going to draw two symbols here. Simplicity I'm going to draw as a circle, and conservativeness... I'm going to draw as an X and, and actually I, um, I want to put a circle here with a plus sign so I'm going to do it like like that um, because what simplicity is anticipating is would would accepting this hypothesis as being true add something new to my picture of reality so think back to the um, the wicked witch turning everyone invisible in the classroom so um, if I was going to accept that hypothesis, now i got to start believing in wicked witches that have the power to turn people invisible, right? I don't, I don't know about your background assumptions, but that doesn't currently exist. I, I think Harry Potter is fictional and not real. <laughs> I don't think that there are these kinds of magical powers that exist in reality, and much less that they're connected with anything that meets the description of being a witch. So... I don't believe in this. If I was going to accept the explanation being offered, I would have to start believing in them. That would be adding something new to my picture of reality, and I don't want to do that. The, the standard, the rational standard of simplicity here is to say explanations that just work with what I've already got in my background assumptions are preferable, they're better, they're more rationally defensible than those that require me to add something totally new. That's the basic idea of simplicity. Um, let me give you another example that comes from the world of physics today, contemporary cutting-edge physics. So uh, I might have mentioned at some point string theory before in the past. I mean, string theory in a nutshell, I mean, this is a really rough and dirty description of string theory. But string theory is saying everything in reality, all particles, subatomic particles, are deep down um, strings. They're, they're little... Uh, circles or lines of vibrating stuff and depending on what energy level that string is vibrating at um, sort of the the frequency of the vibrations that determines what kind of particle it is and how it's going to behave in classical physics okay so under the standard model of quantum mechanics you've got all these different types of subatomic particles you've got gluons and muons and quarks and photons and electrons and all this kind of stuff and what string theory is saying is actually those aren't fundamentally different types of things they're all the same thing they're strings they're just um, vibrating at different energy levels and that's why they take on the properties that they do now string theory is really powerful 
It, I'm using power in this sense. Like, it explains a lot of things for us. It solves some of the problems of contemporary physics. The problem is, um, there's no independent reason to believe in strings other than their explanatory value. So physicists who like string theory like it because they think it's justified on an inference to the best explanation. And the people who don't like string theory um, either take issue with how good of an explanation strings are for all the other things that we're concerned about in physics, but they're also thinking do we have to endorse a totally new type of thing that we didn't believe was a part of reality before? Is there any way to get the stuff that we already know exists um, mobilized to explain the stuff that string theory is capable of explaining? And as long as they're holding out hope for that, they're like, I don't want to necessarily believe in strings. We don't have any ability to directly observe their existence almost by definition, because of what kind of thing we're talking about with the string, theoretically. Um, but they're, they're using this principle of simplicity as a reason to be wary about that theoretical explanation. That to endorse string theory requires believing in something that I didn't believe in before, and I have no independent reason to think is true. Um, so they want to do the opposite, right? Instead of endorsing something new, they're hopeful uh, these skeptics of string theory in the physics community are hopeful that the background assumptions we have about the world already are sufficient to be able to explain this stuff and we don't have to go inventing something new. Okay, chat, how's that going? Andrew, Dania, this is, am I making sense? I know that's a kind of a complicated example of string theory, but I, I hope I was able to make it intelligible. Going good? Okay. So if uh, simplicity is a matter of adding something new to our picture, and that would be not rationally preferable, that would be a bad thing, then conservativeness is worried about a different type of interaction. Conservativeness would be worried that accepting this hypothesis and adding it to my stock of background assumptions contradicts or is in tension with something I already believe. And that's why I drew this as an X. So it's sort of like, I already have a picture of reality, and in order to make room for this new hypothesis, to endorse this explanation that's on the table to be considered, I'd have to erase something else I already believe. I would have to change my background assumptions in order to accept the hypothesis being offered. Um, and I can give you an example of this too. A very famous example from the history of science. Um, so uh, you've heard of Copernicus before, the guy who argued that the Earth is traveling around the Sun rather than that the Sun is traveling around the Earth. That's what Copernicus is famous for. Um, he didn't have the advantage of something like satellites who can take pictures and see, you know, what's going on or, or something like that. Um, Copernicus is just working with uh, astronomy. He's like, there's all these stars in the sky and they're moving in certain ways. And people have been trying to explain this. You know, you had a, um, astronomy going on for a long time, trying to predict the motions of the heavenly bodies. But under the assumption that the sun is traveling around the Earth, this was all really confusing. And I don't know if you've ever seen like old astrolabs or something, like there are these little models that were made in um, earlier centuries. Uh, before Copernicus, that these like really complicated gears on gears on gears to show the mechanisms of how all the stars are moving. Um, the whole idea Copernicus had was really an inference to the best explanation. If I just change that one assumption, if I go from saying uh, instead of the sun traveling around the earth, the earth travels around the sun, now suddenly all the motions of the heavenly bodies make sense in a more elegant and less ad hoc sort of way. So his hypothesis that the Earth is actually traveling around the Sun um, not only had a deep explanation, but it also had a very powerful one. And it didn't have all these extra elements to it that made it less, less elegant, right? Um, so those are all pluses for the theory, for Copernicus's theory. But a lot of scientists around Copernicus's time um, were skeptical, and not because they were dogmatic or unreasonable or something like that. They were skeptical because it requires giving up a pretty big belief, right? Like, I'd have to embrace that contrary to what it sure seems like is happening from direct perceptual report. Like, 
I think I'm not moving and the sun is moving. To endorse Copernicus's um, hypothesis requires giving up previous beliefs. And scientists are willing to do this when there's good cause for it. And that's why ultimately, you know, Copernicus's explanation is a rational one, or maybe the best explanation, is that when it comes to all the other standards, it's doing way better. It's scoring way better than the uh, traditional attempt to explain this under the assumption that the sun is traveling around the Earth. Um, but it still is a ding, right? It's still a concern um, if it's contradicting our previous background assumptions. So that's why we call it conservativeness, that we don't want to have to change our background assumptions unless there's really good cause to do so. It kind of adds extra burden of proof for accepting the hypothesis if it's not going to be conservative. This conservativeness itself may seem like it's closed-minded or something, and I want to be really clear in the lecture here and say that's not what's happening. It's not like this is a, a smokescreen for pre preserving dogmatism or something like that. Um, it's really quite reasonable to prefer an explanation that doesn't require upsetting background assumptions than one that does in as much as I have probably some independent reasons or evidence for endorsing those background assumptions and to accept the hypothesis just on the grounds that it can explain this stuff right now that's going to require me to ditch and discard and throw in the trash all that old um, reasoning and investigation and evidence that I have. I mean, I, if I'm going to pay that cost, it better be worth it. There better be some new explanatory power um, or usefulness or modesty or elegance or something that makes it worth that cost, okay? Um, so when we, I told you we'd talk about conspiracy theories. Most conspiracy theories um, are deep explanations. They don't usually have problems with depth. Some of them do, but a lot of times, you know, the ones that are most compelling that really get people um, are going to be deep. And they're especially going to be powerful. That is where most of the plausibility of conspiracy theories come from. It's like, oh, if that was true, everything makes so much sense now. It all, it all makes sense. That's about power. That intuition there of like that kind of moment or scenario is about power. But the real, the, the really tough part for most conspiracy theories are how they fail the conservativeness standard. They require you to abandon beliefs that seem very well justified, verified, that we have maybe direct evidence for, things like that. Like for me to endorse the idea that, um, like I talked about climate change the other day, for me to endorse the idea that the reason that there's such scientific consensus around human-caused climate change, like anthropogenic climate change, um, that it's a vast liberal conspiracy uh, to, to falsify data for a political objective, that requires me to change a lot of my background assumptions about human psychology, about how cultures work, and just what scientists are up to, like what drives them, and the, and the, the, um, the authority and usefulness of the scientific method. I mean, for me to believe that scores upon scores of sincere scientists are actually insincere, that instead of being um, you know, responsible truth seekers, they're actually willing to distort the truth for some political end. It's just super implausible. <laughs> I have to ditch so many background assumptions to find that, to accept that explanation. Or uh, to make it even more goofy sort of thing, if I was to say, endorse a hypothesis that says Donald Trump is an alien and that's why he behaves in the way he does, um, that is also going to require me to ditch a lot of my beliefs about you know, the evidence I've got for thinking he's just a human being. Like there's some other explanation for why he acts the way that he does or makes the choices that he does other than that he's some extraterrestrial who's hiding in a human you know, body bag or something, right? So um, conspiracy theories can be persuasive um, or we can find them compelling for some legitimate reasons, like uh, power. Power is something we care about. You know, these are uh, the other standards it could be doing well on. But oftentimes conspiracy theories go bad or they go south when it comes to conservativeness. Okay, how's that going, chat? That all making sense? While I, I check in with you, I'm going to do some more drawing here on the whiteboard. Okay.
Cool. Happy to hear that's going good. Um, so we still have falsifiability to talk about here, and I'm just going to bust it out here. we got to do a late start, so I'm going to try to finish this up. Um, ooh. Oh, come on. Opposite. Okay. And then... So falsifiability is a really tricky idea, and I've got another phrase to give you. I'm getting better and better at explaining this over the years, uh, teaching this class. Um, but it's it can be a little confusing because it, it involves a negative thing. We want something to fail. Okay, that, that's the... That's the gist of, uh, of falsifiability here. So uh, let me give you the, the sort of general principle, uh, the idea of this. When it comes to depth, let's go back to depth here for a second. So when it comes to depth, I want a hypothesis that explains why what happened happened. Okay? But a good explanation won't just explain why what did happen did happen. It should also be able to explain why something different didn't happen instead. So it's like, why did this happen instead of something else? So when I've got drawn up here the opposite, I'm talking about the opposite of the stuff to be explained. Not the opposite of the hypothesis, but the opposite of the stuff to be explained. Here's an example that the book uses that is just too good, I'm going to use it. So let's say, uh, the, this is the one, it was like, even though I've been fishing here at this spot in the river, all day long, I haven't caught any fish. That's the stuff to be explained. And the way to explain it is that there are no fish in this river. Okay, so if there were no fish in the river, would you expect to catch fish? No, you wouldn't. That means it's deep. But can it work to explain why something different didn't happen instead? Like instead of not catching fish, what if I did catch fish? Could I use the same hypothesis to work as an explanation there? Could I explain that I caught a bunch of fish because there are no fish in the river? No, that's totally absurd. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. We want the hypothesis to fail. We want it to be falsifiable as an explanation if something different had happened instead, particularly the opposite occurrence of whatever did happen. That, if that happens, if it fails here and it works here, then that means the hypothesis is really drawing this line in the sand between why what did happen did happen as opposed to something else not happening instead. In fact, I'm gonna, th that idea is so crucial, I'm going to draw it on the whiteboard. So let me give myself some more space here to understand this idea of falsifiability. So, uh, where's my mouse? There we go. So we got uh, what did happen. Like maybe didn't catch fish. Okay? And then we've got what didn't happen. In this scenario, I catch fish while I'm fishing. The hypothesis. in this case is there are no fish in the river and this is a falsifiable hypothesis because it works in this case and that's all we mean by saying it's deep so that's depth and over here we're gonna have falsifiable. Um, do, do. So it works in that case, but it doesn't work in this case. That's great. We want this kind of contrast. That means the hypothesis is drawing this really firm line in the sand that explains why what did happen did happen and why what didn't happen didn't happen. Okay, so it's, it's sort of like the hypothesis is defining the deal maker, deal breaker for whether this stuff's going to happen or not. That's what falsifiability is about. So um, the technique is to imagine what didn't happen, the opposite of what did happen, and ask yourself, would this hypothesis work as a good explanation there? If it does work as a good explanation there, that's bad. We don't want that. That means it's not a falsifiable explanation. 
We want it so that the explanation offered, if the world turned out differently, that wouldn't be a good explanation in that case. It, that the, the explanation offered is in principle capable of being falsified. If it's not capable of being falsified, then what situation do we have on our hands? I might articulate it this way. If the hypothesis works for no matter what happens, then we could say, by explaining everything, it really explains nothing. Okay, let me say that again. So, uh, a unfalsifiable hypothesis explains everything. It works as an explanation no matter what happened. But by doing that, by explaining everything, it explains nothing. It doesn't tell us why something happens instead of something else. Let me give you an example of a, so I, this example right here is a falsifiable hypothesis. This is like what we want to have happen. This is, you know, this is good. Checks out. Good. Way to go. Good job hypothesis. Good explanation because it's falsifiable. What is an example of one that isn't? Let's say, so we have a goldfish. And let's say the fish is kind of looking like it's not doing so well. And then it ends up dying. So I, there's all these fish examples here. But so this time what did happen is fish dies. Okay. And let's say my son comes up to me and he's like, Daddy, why did the fish have to die? And I give him the answer as a hypothesis. Well, well, son, it was God's will for the fish to die. So I offer this hypothesis to explain it. Well, what if the opposite had happened instead? What if the fish is like not looking so good, but pulls through and doesn't die? And my son comes up to me and he was like, Daddy, I, I, thought, I thought Gretchen, or that's the name of our fish, I thought Gretchen was going to die, but Gretchen lived. Why did that happen? I thought for sure Gretchen was going to die. And I was like, well, it was God's will for her to live. See, I, I could use the appeal to God's will, uh, or what God wanted to have happen, to explain anything that happened, no matter what, because God's all-powerful, you know, doesn't, you know, whatever happens, happens in accordance with his will. So that hypothesis would work as an explanation no matter what happened, and that means it's not really explaining anything. It's not helpful as an explanation. It doesn't show me where this line is drawn for why something happened versus something else. Now, it, this blunt appeal to God's will, if that's all I've got going on with the hypothesis, then that's not falsifiable. I mean, I could, I could definitely change it up to make it falsifiable. Like, as soon as we start saying anything about... Not, so I'm, I'm not just trashing on theology here. If you start saying things like, God, God's will works a certain way, like God is good, or caring, or loving, or something like that, or just, then for the idea that it was God's will for something to happen starts looking falsifiable, right? That you'd expect something to happen versus something else. And that's actually, just as a side note here, why there's so much debate about uh, what's called the theodicy, or sometimes called the problem of evil, is given how much bullshit and injustice and suffering happens in this world, um, how is that explainable under the premise that there's a, a good God who is controlling everything? Maybe that's that explanation, there is no way to explain that. So that's, a, that's connected to an inference, the best explanation argument. How do you explain this world under the assumption that God exists, he's powerful, and he's caring and loving and just and moral? Okay, so this is inference the best explanation. We've covered all seven standards now. Um, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, that's our old stuff about statistical stuff. Um, how's it going, chat? Thank you for everyone who's toughed it through and is still here. Um, uh, yeah, any, any questions I can answer before we close up shop for today? Thank you for sticking around for me to get this video finished. Oh, right, code word. Um, so the code word today, uh, I just chose what was on my mug. Uh, and I know you can't see it right now, but it says, see the good. So that's the code word for today, see the good. I'm not going to do it visually because it's just not working for everyone who's in chat right now. See the good. Here, I can even uh, type that into the chat here. See the good. That's the code word. All right.
yeah, you're welcome. Um, I hope this was clear and made sense. Um, uh, I will be posting this on YouTube, so if you want to listen to me talk over something again, I've tried in each one of these cases to give you some kind of technique, a practical technique for how to apply the standard to a particular explanation. Um, if there's any questions about that, let me know. I think it's a really good idea to try out some homework problems this weekend that are in the IBE section from Chapter 10 um, and try your hand at it. And it, it, it takes some practice to figure out how to articulate you know, the sensitivity to these different principal dynamics. But um, there you go. I, ho I hope this helps. And uh, be in contact with me about any difficulties you're having uh, trying to execute on it for yourself at home um, with some actual problems uh, from the homework. And uh, we'll touch base next week. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to work out some of the, some of the kinks in that um, and get you where you want to be. If there's anything else, have a good weekend, everyone, and don't be shy about contacting me over the weekend. I'm here to help. Bye.